I, I'm so glad that you are here. I want to thank you for being here. I want to acknowledge that I am here on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation, but I acknowledge that the ELCIC has its buildings and ministries from coast to coast to coast on traditional territories of Indigenous peoples. And some of those are governed under a variety of treaties, and some of those are unceded territories. Working for reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, respecting Indigenous rights and learning from Indigenous wisdom is essential to climate justice and renewed relationships with the land. I'd invite you in the chat to acknowledge the territory that you are on. I'm really looking forward to this day and to learning from the wisdom that Erica and Kata and Jeff will share with us. Um, but let us begin uh, with prayer. So the Lord be with you. Creating God, you made this beautiful world full of life. And we read in Genesis that you gave us the stewardship of this land. We confess to you that we have not been good stewards, that we have plundered the earth, that we have not um, respected other peoples, especially indigenous peoples, that we have let corporate greed and um, desires for good economy take precedence over the care of this land and the waters and the air and the creatures, trees, plants. And we have not been good neighbors. We hope and pray that this time together as we look at the question of climate justice and hear from leaders who have participated in COP would inspire us to continue to work for justice for the earth and for all creation. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Gretchen. Thank you, Bishop Susan. Um, I just want to mention that this event came about, um, was initiated by the BC Synod's, I don't know the official name, but Climate Justice Group. And um, then we offered to get on board and help spread the news across the whole church that this was happening. So we're grateful for the initiative of the BC Synod in starting this. Um, it's my uh, privilege to introduce our three panelists this morning. Um, Jeff Buzzi is a member of St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Winnipeg and had the privilege to represent the Lutheran World Federation at COP18 in Doha, COP20 in Lima, and finally COP21 in Paris to witness the signing of the Paris Accord. Jeff initially became involved with the climate justice movement as a youth delegate at the LWF General Assembly in Stuttgart, Germany in 2010 and hasn't looked back. He has spent two full terms on the ELCIC National Church Council as the MNO lay representative, as well as many synodical and congregational committees and task forces over the years. Jeff currently works as the chief operations officer for his wife's artisanal candle company and has a 13 year old Shih Tzu named Pancakes, who you might see during this call sometime. We've already seen her. <laughs> uh, Erica Rodney is from Edmonton, Alberta. She attended COP25 in Madrid, Spain as part of the LWF's youth delegation. She is a clinical dietitian currently pursuing her master's of public health in health policy and management. She is interested in and has past involvement in the areas of preventative health, global health, food security, international, de international development and sustainability. And Katarina Kunert is an early career circumpolar climate scientist who represented the LWF at the 2021 COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, 
and was previously a delegate at the 2015 pre-COP 21 Future of Life in the Arctic events in Sweden. She is a non-Indigenous Canadian living north of the Arctic Circle in Inuvik Northwest Territories. She has, she has worked to model sea level and ecosystems change, monitor permafrost environments, promote anti-colonial approaches to conservation, and support circumpolar youth in land-based learning. So thank you to the three of you for joining us. It's neat to read through your, those bios, quite diverse. Uh, and yet, you know, you're all passionate about the environment. So I think that's really cool. So our first question, and Jeff is going to be the first one to tackle this question. Tell us about yourself and tell us what are the three most important lessons you learned from your COP participation? All right, well, thank you for having me. Um, as my bio stated, I've had a, a I've been very fortunate over the years to have um, some pretty serious involvement with the Lutheran World Federation and uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Conference of Parties. Um, I got involved originally with the Lutheran World Federation in 2009 um, at, a, at a workshop on youth decision making in the church. Um, and then when I started with the COP, it at that point, we didn't really know what the LWF's role was um, with, with, the, with the cops. And so I do not have a science background. I'm not a science person. And so it's exciting for me to see sort of how it's shifted and how I've been followed up by people probably far more qualified to attend these conferences. Um, but so to the question of um, what are the three things that I learned as a COP participant? Um, the, the, the first one is just how slowly things move on an international scale um, and with large political entities such as the United Nations or just general um, uh, federal governments. Um, the negotiations themselves are very systematic and they really really get bogged down on the semantics of how negotiations work like you will if you watch the actual negotiations they sit there and they will argue about one word whether it should be in or within and it gets down and slow um and when you get there you kind of get distracted by the fact that it's like all oh, right this is a very serious discussion that we're having and you like it it's they kind of it's as if the negotiators have taken the actual subject out of out of what they're talking about and it turns into talking about words and you kind of forget that's like oh right this is like worldwide climate change that we're talking about and science so it's kind of hard to keep the humanity in the in the discussions and that's a big part part of what the LWF is there to do to help remind negotiators and other active parties that this is a real deal thing um, it was also a little disheartening when you hear the countries talk about what their targets are a lot of times they sort of start off with like okay we want to hit this target and then they start pushing each other and they're like, okay, we can get to this point. And so ultimately, you know, they've a max target that they can reach, but because it's a negotiation, it's like buying a car. You never start off with your best offer. And this is something that you need to start with your best offer. This is the world we're talking about. So that was, a, it was a little bit disheartening in that, in that regard. Um, the, the second biggest big thing that I really took away is that serious change is needed. Um, when I was involved with the, the COP meetings, there was still lots of discussion about whether or not, like my very first one, there was still discussion about whether or not this is happening, like whether climate change is human caused or 
um, um, pushed faster. I can't think of the word I want right now, but whether it's caused by human actions. And so that was still part of the discussion. And so at least now we've sort of moved past that. Um, but there's, for me, what I've really learned is that we need to have, there needs to be top-down action. So there needs to be policies made by government sort of making these, these targets, but also there needs to be movement starting on an individual, more grassroots level. Um, so like the way I sort of look at it is that governments work slow and they ultimately do what will get them reelected. So if they're not getting huge push from the, the electorate that climate change is something that we wanna see action on, they're not gonna make action on it. And so it needs to sort of happen eventually if enough people are saying we want climate action from our government and they can see it happening from the everyday people, then eventually the governments are gonna start thinking about this too. Like this last federal election was the first time that all the parties actually acknowledged, all the major parties acknowledged climate change is something that we actually need to work with or work on. So I'm seeing a change since I've been involved. Um, but so that was my second thing that I really learned was that yes, we wanna see governments making good policy and actually moving things forward um, in acting on climate change, but there also needs to be some serious um, changes and actions made by the everyday person. Um, and then the third thing I really took away is that there's some cool stuff out there, <laughs> um, like just in terms of what sort of science is happening. And I'm sure Kata knows this mo much better than I do, um, but like there's just really cool science out there. There's cool ideas that are just circulating around. And there's so many options that now that people are starting to think about this, things can really start rolling forward. And so I know my first takeaway was a little bit doom and gloom, but ultimately I, I'm, I'm still optimistic that we can make some, some positive change and I'm excited about the future. Um, when I was in Paris, I got to sit down with Jeffrey Sachs, who's a very well-known um, economist about moving towards a green economy. And like people like that just have some really cool ideas. And even, I remember a few years ago, there was this whole video movement about um, solar roadways, about how you get these like little solar panels that are like bricks that you can like interlock. And so you can turn like sidewalks and roadways into a whole solar panel, obviously very expensive and not necessarily practical in, in Winnipeg for too much snow or whatever. But the fact that you can get like, solar power shingles and like there's just so many options out there or like algae power like that's supposed to be a big thing um and then there's also just so many people committed to this cause so like what i've learned for myself is i'm not much of an activist even i after my experience with cop i thought to myself huh maybe i'm i've got this all this experience maybe i'm suited for politics so i ran for mla twice in when in within Manitoba, didn't do very well. Well, for a green in Manitoba, I did very well. But what I learned the, in my second campaign was that people were coming after me and I do not have a thick enough skin for this. But so there are people out there with boots on the ground and that are really committed to this movement and can, it, it's like water off a duck's back. They just are pushing for it. And it's so exciting to see, I don't know, it just makes me excited and I'm, I'm very excited about what is possible in the future. And then the last point I'm gonna just sort of draw attention to is the fact that um, down approach as well as the grassroots approach, we are starting to see this in a lot of things. So for example, like the major car manufacturers in North America, um, like Chrysler has committed to having entire like their entire line of vehicles are gonna be electric by 2028, GM by 2035, Ford is gonna be 50% electric by 2030. So like we're moving in the right direction and we're starting to see it on a larger scale and not just people at home turning down their thermostats. There's more to it than that. And it's 
making me excited. Um, so those are like my big three takeaways. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I noticed during the Super Bowl, there were quite a few electric car commercials. So I can see that being reflected some of the things you're talking about. Uh, Erica, you're next. So tell us what are the three most important lessons you learned from your COP participation? Yeah, and I will also say thanks to everyone for coming. It's great to see you here today and interested in this topic. Um, so for me, the first thing that I took away from COP25 was just the sheer urgency of climate change. So I went into this, you know, already interested in climate change, already having um, been involved in the area at home. Um, and like, I live in Alberta, so wishing that others around me cared more about the topic, um, wishing that Alberta and Canada were doing more. Um, but going to COP25 is such a powerful experience where there's so many people there and they're so passionate about the area. And you have people who are on the same page about how urgent this is. And then you start to kind of hear more of the messaging and, and get more of the data and a kind of hear some of those messages that aren't reaching everyday citizens in Canada. Um, even as an example, like at COP25, they wouldn't say climate change, they were saying the climate crisis. So it kind of hits home like how urgent this is. So um, I feel like the messages aren't hitting home as much as they should here. Um, I mean, sometimes we hear about climate change on the news, sometimes we read about it, sometimes there's people advocating. Um, but I think in some other countries, the message are the messaging is much more drastic and people are, are really feeling um, the effects of climate change more. Um, I think in Canada, there's a lot of people who are willing to make like small changes, um, but don't want kind of a big inconvenience to their lives. So for example, might be willing to use like reusable bags, um, but don't want major inconveniences like the cost that it would require um, to invest in some other types of energy, for example. So I think part of that stems from people not feeling the urgency. And I don't think it's like individual fault. I think it's um, just like, as a country, we're not as worried about it yet. Um, but if there was more of that sense of urgency, there might be more urgent um, feelings to take action. So I was at COP a couple of years ago. So Kata has like more updated, probably perspectives on the, the science end of it. But when I was there, um, we were talking a lot about the, the goal of having 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. Um, and every country had set kind of targets as to what they would do to be able to reach that um, warming goal. And what really hit home to me was that, you know, often we set goals, we don't achieve them. Um, and even if every country had set, even if every country reached the goals that they had set, it still wouldn't have been enough. Um, so, you know, things have progressed now where now we've moved forward a couple of years um, from that. But yeah, that's my first thing is just like how urgent this crisis is. The second thing that I learned was that we really need system, systemic change in order to resolve this crisis. Um, so the scope of the problem is so large that we'll need to have like big system country level change. And it's not to kind of belittle individual actions that we can all take um, for climate change. But I think even if we all take individual small actions, 
it won't be enough. We really need the country level action um, that are kind of looking at changing our entire systems. Like how do we get energy? How do we um, like plan our cities? Just many of those really big things. Um, so I think when it comes to us taking action, some of the really important things are talking about climate change with other people, um, advocating with our organizations or companies, our government, um, so that those large bodies can make um, decisions and actions that will have kind of even more of an impact than we can have on our own. Um, one thing I wish is that climate change was less of a political party thing um, that, you know, parties weren't putting this on their platform to compete with each other, that we could have kind of all political parties agree, you know, and Jeff kind of talked about that a little bit at the federal level, but um, getting everyone on board that this is an issue that we need to tackle regardless of political parties so that we're not hung up by these like four year cycles that things kind of don't get done that we can all kind of like every party can try to make some progress on the issue that over a large number of years we can make a, a significant impact. The third thing that I took away from COP was that developed countries should be accountable for dealing with some of the problems that they created. So if we think way back to when developed countries kind of became developed, um, they went through industrial revolutions. Um, you know, they, they were using the, the things that happened used a lot of fo fossil fuels um, and contributed to climate change. And those industrial revolutions are what helped these countries gain power and gain money um, and kind of end up where they are today. So, you know, we've learned a lot since that time. We didn't maybe know at the time the impact that, that those actions would have on climate change, but here we are today. Um, the, the tricky part is that a lot of the developed countries aren't the ones that are feeling the effects of climate change the most strongly. So some of the developing countries who didn't really contribute to climate change, you know, like maybe some, for example, some of the smaller, um, poorer islands are really feeling the effects of climate change right now with rising sea levels and flooding and all of that, but didn't really contribute to the issue, but now don't have the funds to deal with the aftermath. So I think it's on us, like we have a responsibility, um, but we also have an ability. So it's not all, you know, doom and gloom, like Jeff would say. Um, you said that and I realized like, oh no, all of my points are a little doom and gloomy, but it's not all doom and gloom because as developed countries, we do have the power, we have the money, um, we have the technologies, we have what we need. We just need the will there to take accountability and um, like help to help some of these other countries deal with the effects of climate change, as well as step up and kind of take further action to reduce the future impact that we're gonna have on climate change. Um, so I think we need to talk about it more in Canada. Great, thanks, Erica. Okay, Kata, you're next. The three most important lessons you learned from your COP experience, which has been the most recent one. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks for having me and really nice to get to the chance to listen to Jeff and Erica talk about their experiences. And it's really a privilege to be able to have this institutional memory in our church uh, dating back to 
2012 and COP18 from Jeff, um, to be able to continue to hear from those experiences over time. I think that's really a luxury that we have within our church. And so thank you to the ELCIC and the LWF for continuing to send us, uh, and especially for continuing to send us as youth um, to represent our communities in these conversations. So just to very briefly introduce myself, um, so I'm Kata and I live on uh, Inubialuit Gwich'in and Northern Métis lands here in Inubic Northwest Territories. Um, this is the community where I was born and I would describe myself as a kid who loves the land. And it's my privilege to be here on these indigenous lands that have been protected against um, different forms of extractivism by indigenous communities um, since time immemorial and recently through the Committee for Original Peoples Entitlement in the Dene Nation organization in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, with respect to the Mackenzie Valley gas line uh, pipeline and uh, the oil wells in Norman Wells. So um, that their, their passion for the land is why I get to experience the beauty of this land right now. Um, and so I, that informs my work um, going into COP26. Uh, I've worked in climate science for over six years. Um, and the first thing I learned uh, in my experience at COP was that even with the access to the best science in the world, we need policy and financial support to create sustained action on big issues such as climate change. So uh, with the, these Conference of the Parties, COP, um, we have access to science created by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They release reports um, that uh, explain our current set of circumstances around climate science. And um, this, is, this is important for us to have. It's valuable, valuable for us to look at data, statistics. They release regional reports about what's going on in our countries and our regions of the world. Um, and this is really valuable. So I, I work in permafrost science. Um, and what we see in this region of the Western Arctic is, you know, we're having disproportionate warming. Our average temperatures are up six degrees Celsius. We're having high rates of coastal erosion causing communities like Tuktoyaktuk to be um, literally falling into the Arctic Ocean needing to be relocated. Um, we're seeing um, permafrost thawing. So there's ice in the ground that as the temperatures warm, that ice thaws and the ground caves in and creates these pockmarks on the landscape that make it unsafe to travel, that make it very dangerous, that cause landslides. So we're seeing these effects of climate change every day, but we don't have the ability as scientists to address the problem. The problem is bigger than us. We can monitor permafrost thaw, but we can't treat it. We're like a doctor. We see the symptoms, but the illness is big, bigger than our ability to treat it on our own. As scientists, we don't have all of the tools. We need political and financial tools. And I'm actually gonna share my screen for a second. Um, so I hope that this is something that you can see and maybe you can give me a little thumbs up here if you can see this slide. Great. So. Right now we have the LWF calls to action with respect to what we would consider um, successful uh, commitments coming out of COP26. So I'll just move, work through them a little bit. So the first is we wanna see accelerated emissions reductions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we want countries in the world to commit to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions to be in line with that 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. According to the IPCC, we're currently on track to hit 1.5 degrees of warming by 2040. We're already locked in for about 1.1 degrees of warming. So the situation is very urgent. And just to put that into perspective, in, in Canada, we have you know, the oil sands, which many people are familiar with. There's um, about 170 billion barrels of oil that could be extracted from that region. According to Scientific America, American, if we were to burn all that oil, the contribution to temperature, global temperature rise could be 0 0.4 degrees Celsius, which would bring us over the 1.5 degrees Celsius, Celsius limit just with Canada and that one region of extraction alone. So what we're talking about to achieve these emissions reductions is a very significant change to global energy infrastructure, to the way that we as communities and as individuals receive our power, to the way that we structure different, uh, different uh, economic activities. And similarly, like how our governmental structures are 
designed to support activities like extraction. So it's actually a very significant and fundamental shift to the way that we, especially in the developed world, organize our lives and our societies to commit to this emissions reduction reduction target. And how, how can we how can we how can we do this? To do this, we need to have resources. So we need to provide climate finances to support vulnerable communities. And like Erica said, this should come from developed countries uh, which have benefited off of historic emissions um, and be shared with developing nations who have been historically exploited in the name of the development of colonial nations, of um, developed nations, hyper-industrialized nations. So there's conversations in the global sphere about developed nations providing finances to developing nations so that they can do the work of emissions reductions. But we're not just trying to reduce our emissions, we're, which would be called mitigation, mitigate our emissions, reduce them. We also have to adapt to the effects of climate change as we're experiencing them now. So for instance, the way that I mentioned it was that our, re, our, our neighbors in Tukchayuktuk are facing coastal erosion that's causing their community to have to be relocated. That's an adaptation in the face of climate change. So the LWF is calling for our global community to support adaptation action in vulner, vulnerable communities so that they can adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, but it's hard to do that adaptation work under duress, under stress. When things are really hard, it's challenging to make big changes. So we want to advert, minimize, and address loss and damage. Loss and damage is damage to infrastructure, loss of life, um, loss of political infrastructures, political instability, climate refugees. These are all forms of loss and damage that we want to, um, to prevent as much as possible. And then um, we're not just doing this work for people who are alive today, but we're also doing it for future generations. And so we need to support youth-led action and intergenerational justice, um, meaning that uh, as young people, we know that we'll be here, God willing, in the, in the future, in, in 20 years and 50 years, um, and we'll have to bear that accountability for our actions now. And we want to, to understand that we're supporting the generations to come. So we have to think about what the equity is between people who are alive today all over the world in our global community and also the generations that are to come. So um, that's, that's my first lesson. I know that's quite a bit of information there, but about how, how do we take science and support the findings of science with policy, with economics, with global cooperation, um, those, that, that was a lesson that was really valuable to me as a climate scientist uh, who didn't particularly have a passion for international economics. My, my second lesson is that activism and visible opposition to the status quo are necessary for increasing the level of ambition in international politics. Um, if we're unhappy with the choices of our leadership and the structure of our communities, then we have to let them know uh, and it's faithful action to loudly ask for um, better and more just systems. The ACT Alliance does this. The World Council of Churches does this. The Lutheran World Federation does this. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada does this. We had letters to our political leaders about what we wanted to see at COP26. That's how we demonstrate accountability, but we also demonstrate accountability through protest, through demonstration, through land defense, through supporting indigenous land defenders on their traditional territories. Um, we're, we're living in a system that has a mindset of colonial interventionism, which has resulted in an extractive mindset that caused climate change. And to support a future that looks different than the past, we have to uplift marginalized voices and accept that there might be some growing pains in doing so. Um, and we want, as we set up systems that are non-exploitative and non-extractive in nature, but we can look to indigenous communities and leaders and especially land defenders for guidance on how to take part in this work because climate justice on indigenous lands is necessarily intertwined with the rights of indigenous peoples. And global indigenous peoples are bringing expert knowledges about land and climate change to international fora like COP but because they've been uh, like strategically not represented in the conversations, 
those important knowledges about land are not represented in global governance. Uh, and so activism, visible opposition to the status quo, that's one method of contributing to a system that denies um, a place for these voices in fora like COP. So, um, you know, LWF is demonstrating at COP. We, we youth planned the first um, Lutheran World Federation youth led um, stunt or a demonstration at COP26. Uh, and we're, we're working to support both within systems and outside systems. And, and that, that dual level of uh, communication is important. And then my last lesson is that we're not doing this work alone. We have all those leaders I just mentioned that we're looking for. We have our partners, the World Council of Churches, the Lutheran World Federation, the ACT Alliance. We're, parts of, we're a part of a community that replicates at scale. We're Canadian people of faith doing this work. We have Canadian allies through group, groups like the Climate Action Network Canada. We have global faith community, like those groups I just mentioned, World Council of Churches, Lutheran World Federation, that ties us in to global peoples experiencing different global impacts of climate change. And global citizens are individuals understanding ourselves to be experiencing the impacts of climate change every day. And that motivates us to our action. And we're motivated to action through love. Fossil fuel lobbyists are also not alone. Over 500 fossil fuel lobbyists attended COP26, but they are connected through greed. We are connected through love and love will always be a stronger motivator for shaping our world. Um, so it's good to do this good work and good company. So, and those were three lessons that I learned uh, at COP26. Thank you so much to all three of you um, for sharing what you learned over your all these it is really neat to have this collective history of ELCIC youth participation in different COPs and to hear what you learned. And also I, what really strikes me is just the passion you have in sharing it with us. So I'm really grateful for that, um, that you take the time to share it with us. Um, just a reminder to everyone that if you'd like to ask a question, please pop it in the chat and we'll get to your questions after our panelists answer our next question but please feel free to use the chat as a way to uh, submit your question. So the second question we have, and um, Jeff, we're gonna start with you again, <laughs> is what do you think is the role of faith organizations in dealing with the climate crisis? And what advice would you have for ELCIC Ang and Anglican congregations? Yeah, so, um... <laughs> in terms of the role um, as faithful people, um, we have a responsibility to be good stewards of the creation that has been provided us. Um, so as such, uh, we need to be good role models for our communities. Um, like us as like everyone on this call clearly has an interest in this topic. So if we can be good role models within our own church congregations, but then if our church congregations or our church communities can then sort of go out and be good role models for our friends, our coworkers, for people outside of our like own and sort of expand that, it then just goes, it reaches further. Um, sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. So yeah, with our, like within our, within the ELCIC, like we were saying, like there's a good, here we have people who have had these opportunities to go to these high level negotiations, bring back that information. And it's, it's a lot of information that's pretty inaccessible to the average person, just in terms of the language used, um, even just finding the information. It's, it can be tricky to just sort of know what's actually happening. And so having people such as Erica or Kata or myself um, to help sort of, uh, some of that um, I think is, is super helpful. Um, but so as I was kind of mentioning before with the, the church, it's also helping to keep keeping the humanity within the science. Kata is far more articulate about this topic, I feel. And so I'm not gonna get too much into that, but there's a really good way of ensuring that our actions and our policies are guided by good science. Um, and so 
then in terms of advice is my biggest piece of advice is always work with small incremental changes. Ultimately, we need huge systemic changes um, just in the way our policies are done and the, our day-to-day -day actions in order to really make um, effective and meaningful change in our climate emergency that we are in, um, we need to make changes. That being said, just having like a big circuit breaker and cut off to change everything realistic. It also needs to be something that's more sustainable in doing. Um, so what I always like to say is that like ultimately, if we start here, we want to eventually be over here. When you look at the things that need to be done that's over here, based on what we're currently doing, it looks daunting and impossible. But if we take just little baby steps and sort of start to move the needle towards it, soon that lofty goal isn't that far. Um, like, so, and again, like when I was more involved with this, this was a decade ago. <laughs> so people have changed a lot in the last 10 years. And, but so it, like looking at what your carbon footprint is and just Googling, how can I lower my carbon footprint? You'll see lots of little things like trying to use a little bit less water when you're brushing your teeth or turning your thermostat down by a degree or two. Little things like that. Ultimately, like my wife and I, we went down to one vehicle. And when we first thought about that, we were like, ooh, that's kind of scary, especially in Winnipeg, because there's lots of snow. And I kind of was like, nope, I'm just gonna bike everywhere. And I'm a crazy, winter cyclist so it's like I'm, I avoid people it's not a very popular thing in Winnipeg um, but when we first went down to one car my wife was terrified and didn't want to do it but and that's a, a, a more like extreme change but once we kind of got down to one car we're like okay this is easy and now it's like once that becomes your new normal your personal needle has shifted and now it's easier to make additional little steps and the the big steps start to look smaller once you've done the little ones again i i'm not very concise so i would just like reiterate the same information multiple times so i'll leave it at that but that's ultimately my my biggest advice for churches is work slowly um try to get involved with like the programs that are available through like the elcic we have the greening faith communities um, we have the season of creation. There's lots of different organizations that have different um, like certifications or suggestions on making yourself or your church congregation or just your communities in general, a little bit more green. And so starting small and ratcheting it up to a much bigger, more like substantial change is ultimately my biggest advice. Great, thank you. It's bike to work week, winter version next week in Saskatoon. So things, uh, you know, things happen at our city municipal levels too, that encourage us to try something in the in that direction. So it's good to look for those things as well. Okay, Erica, uh, what do you think is the role of faith organizations in dealing with the climate crisis? And what advice would you have for ELCIC uh, and Anglican congregations? So I think that faith communities have a great potential in terms of making a difference because uh, one thing that I kind of recognized when I was at COP25 is that most of the world actually does have a faith background. We might have different religions, but so many people out there are connected to one faith or another. And at COP, we, as a part of the Lutheran World Federation delegation, we weren't just off on our own doing our own thing. We connected with other faith groups um, and kind of were on a common page. And so it's pretty amazing to see, like if we have all of these different religions who can all connect to, um, they can connect their faith to climate change. And maybe I don't completely understand their religion, but we can be on the same page about how it's connected. Imagine what we could do if we had all of those people 
those faith communities around the whole world working on this issue. I mean, I feel like we could just solve it just like that. Um, so I feel like one aspect of our role is just harnessing that power that we have in numbers to make a difference. And it's not just numbers. So um, our connection between faith and climate change gives us kind of a calling, like it gives us more of a purpose that there's meaning behind what we're doing. And so that can be really powerful. Like when we have something that's driving us to make positive change, um, that, that isn't, it's not just about ourselves. It's, it's something bigger that can have a really powerful impact. Um, and then even going beyond that, like faith organizations have previously been involved in a lot of global issues. So, you know, we instinctively think of faith communities connected to things like hunger or poverty or disaster relief. You know, I'm sure as I say those things, you're picturing, you know, initiatives that have been done. Um, and it's, it's something that we just like automatically connect in our mind, but I don't think that we're there yet with climate change. Um, and maybe the reason is that that is just something that's newer, or maybe people are worried that there will be controversy behind it, or um, maybe, you know, faith communities don't quite see the, the strong connection yet. Um, I don't know what it is, but I think like how amazing would it be if we, if we could get on that bandwagon as well and start trying to tackle um, that global issue. Um, and then another kind of advantage that I think faith communities have in tackling climate change, in addition to all of those things, you know, our numbers, our, our strong calling, um, our, our history of working on global issues. We already have like these strong networks of people, you know, like we're organized, you know, at a congregation level, at a synod level, a national level, international level. We've got leaders in place. Um, we've got people on the ground who are ready to run with projects. Um, we've got people who are strong advocates. We have climate change specialists. Um, we already have all of those things in place. So if we you know, try to tackle a new issue, it's not like we're restarting, right? We already have everything that we need. Um, so I think that piece of it is exciting um, that I think, I, I guess I talked more about kind of our potential, but I think that's what our role could be is harnessing all of those things that we have already to make a powerful difference. So when it comes to advice that I would have to ELCIC congregations, um, I'll, I'll bring you back to when I was at COP25, I, I remember thinking like, okay, I'm having this amazing, powerful experience. Like it's life changing. I need to go back and I need to share my story. How am I gonna go back to Alberta and share this story? Like people are gonna hate me. Um, so that's what I was worrying about the first, the first week that I was there. What, what is my strategy? How can I kind of like, you know, get people to understand this with like the least damage possible? And then, and then the, the experience was so powerful that moving into my second week there, I was like, you know what? Like, it doesn't even matter. Like we need, uh, like we need to take action. And um, this is so important that like the stories just need to be shared. Um, but what I realized was, you know, I have a good relationship in my congregation. I've been, I've, grown up in the congregation. I have great relationships with everyone. Um, I've been very involved. And often people are just grateful to see young people coming to church and being involved. 
And I figured, you know what, like I can just share my story. I can be honest. I'm not a climate change expert. Um, you know, I'm not working in this area like Kata is, um, but I have, you know, interest in the area. I have experiences to share and I can help motivate people. So, you know, maybe all it comes down to is building on those personal relationships and kind of sharing the stories and getting people to consider new things. Um, so I think my advice would be instigating discussions within congregations. Um, they can be informal discussions, they can be bringing in speakers, it can be workshop series, um, but aiming for kind of like open learning experiences and not kind of judgmental, critical um, talks or anything like that. Um, building on relationships, involving youth in the process, because often youth are, are really care about this topic, they're passionate about it, they have um, knowledge and experience to share and can kind of move the, whatever it's called, like, you know, kind of push for change. Um, and then involving faith groups that are already working on this area. So again, you don't have to reinvent all of the wheel. Like there are resources out there um, to support these types of discussions or, um, you know, having Bible studies related to sustainability. Those are just some examples and, and Jeff named some as well. And then, um, like you said, kind of aiming for small incremental changes. So even having small discussions um, like prompting those discussions can lead to a ripple effect where individuals are then, you know, going back to their friends, their family, their workplaces and kind of enacting more change. So I think we have kind of great potential and we, the next step is just kind of harnessing it. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. Okay, Kata, you're next. <laughs> Again, just a pleasure to listen to Jeff and Erica talking about um, their perspectives and really helping to inform my own perspective. And uh, I think that's like a great thing about doing this work together is that this is part of the strength of faith communities, right? Is that we can create these spaces where we're able to connect across our skill, our skill, different skills, our different experiences by our faith. And like Erica said, I think 80% of the world's population subscribes to some faith community. So it's a great opportunity to connect across, across different motivations for um, moral and ethical leadership. So to me, that's what people look to from faith communities. Faith communities have a role in the climate crisis as moral and ethical leaders. We're trusted to provide a compass for action that is um, just and not just convenient or politically advantageous. We, we have the opportunity to continue across long time frames because faith is something that uh, we subscribe to for our whole lifetime, not just for one political cycle. But we have not always played this role well. So um, we know that papal bulls, terra nullius, the doctrine of discovery were some of the foundation for creating um, the social and governing structures that led to, in Canada, the extraction of Indigenous peoples off their traditional and ancestral lands in the name of uh, resource extraction from under their feet. Um, and we know that, you know, through, through our own country, you know, the way that Canada has organized our mining laws, for instance, are so lax that a lot of global mining companies are based out of Canada and then commit um, human rights atrocities in other countries, sometimes in the name of taking the minerals that are then used to create things like the solar panels that we wanna use for our climate, um, our, to hit our climate targets. So, so we know that we haven't always played this role well as faith communities, as Canadians. Um, so if we want to nurture the trust that people have put in us as faith leaders, we have to be brave. We have to be bold, action-oriented, empathetic, reciprocal, and vocal leaders lead. And that means making hard choices and doing hard things. A personal example is that 
you know, when I was in my, my youth delegation for the Lutheran World Federation, we're an international delegation, and some of my colleagues are from Tanzania, and I happen to know that Canadian mining companies have committed numbers of um, human rights abuses within that country, but connecting through our faith means that I get to put a face to people who are experiencing the fallout of what I know that my country has committed. So we get to humanize these issues across time, space, and difference. Um, and so that's that's a benefit that that we have through our faith communities and through that network building and that um, that foundation that we have in how to relate to each other through our faith. Um, and then with respect to the climate crisis, you know, I was I was in some of your churches in 2000 since 2016 talking about climate change, talking about incremental changes. And now it's more than five years later and we've seen some changes, but the, the pace of our problem is developing faster than the pace of our resolutions. So now we're facing the need to make major systemic changes over the next 20 to 30 years across all sectors of our society, because that's what these net zero pledges will look like if we take them seriously. And if we refuse to take those actions, then we're facing the, the risk of, um, experimental technologies, geoengineering solutions, tech solutionism, trusting that we can develop scientific tools that will solve our problems without changing our mindset, without changing the way that we relate to the earth, without changing the way that we relate to each other. And I fundamentally don't believe that that is practical because I recognize that science is a tool for us to resolve our issues, but um, our humanity is also a tool for us to resolve our issues. Our faith is also a tool for us to resolve our issues. And science has hands, but it has no heart. So one of the things that we bring to the table is we bring that heart. Um, so we're facing some pretty big changes that might feel drastic, scary, challenging, uncomfortable. Um, many of us will be doing this work with what feels like limited resources, as many churches are already struggling to keep their doors open. Um, but our faith gives us tools to manage things that are scary and uncomfortable. We have hope and faith and grace and love and compassion. We have a spirit for justice. We have an intolerance for cruelty. And it's not that there's nothing for us to do. Like apathetic dread would be telling you that there's no way to resolve these issues that we're talking about and address these challenges. And that's not true. It's just that what that looks like will mean restructuring our societies, our economies, how we relate to each other. And it's my fundamental belief that the best climate action from the church is supporting indigenous sovereignty, self-determination and repatriation of lands. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, and as members of the church, decolonizing means rejecting terra nullius and the doctrine of discovery as a justification for um, colonial occupation of land in the name of extractive industries that exacerbate the current climate crisis. And this isn't something that's very unfamiliar to us because in 2015, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada repudiated and renounced um, the doctrine of discovery um, and commit and, you know, confess that we're, we're contributing to ongoing patterns of um, land and environmental occupation, and that we need to change the way that we relate to, to land, environment, and Indigenous communities. And since we have advocated to the Canadian government to honor the rights of Indigenous peoples, including the right to self-determination, which is part of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which received royal assent to Canadian law on June 21st, 2021. So decolonization is vital as a refusal to replicate systems of oppression and domination within the green economy and the governance systems we're uplifting as the alternative to non-renewable exploitation. And we can look to indigenous led climate organizations and communities for stewardship and action. Um, and uh, and to, do, to do this work to support um, uh, you know, creating new systems of governance, new economies, relationships with sovereign indigenous nations on their ancestral lands. And these solutions are not easy. Uh, you might wish for me to tell the youth that they're easy. Uh, I'm sorry. These are not simple things to do. The simple things make a difference. The simple things build momentum, build our confidence, build our connections and communities so that we have the strength to do this work that is hard. Simple solutions are very important. We have to we have to work at multiple levels of scales according to our capacities and build our capacities um, to do hard things. But we have tools that support us to do hard things. 
Um, however, we'll be in a much better place to do this work if we start now, rather than waiting until we're in absolute crisis. Doing this work under duress is very challenging. The duress of natural disasters, um, of relocation and displacement. Um, the longer we wait, the more we commit ourselves to compounded suffering. So let's build our community networks. Let's build our networks of support. Let's use our solidarity with international communities. Let's access resources like our, um, our connections through the Lutheran World Federation, the World Council of Churches, our connections to political leaders, uh, our networks within our grassroots networks within our own communities. Uh, let's be brave now. Let's do the work together now. And let's not forget that it's, it's our love for our neighbors and for God's good creation that motivates us and strengthens us in this work. Oof. Well, that was great. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was like, can I get an amen? That's what I felt like saying. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. And I just, um, I, I don't know if many of you know, but I actually have an environmental science degree that I took many years ago now. And it's nice to kind of refresh my passion as I spending time with the three of you over leading up to this event of, um, of, you know, caring for this, this wonderful, beautiful home that we have. And, uh, you know, we want to live on this earth in a good and just way. And what can we do as faithful people in order to do that? Um, it does feel overwhelming sometimes for sure. But I thank you for sharing some of the little things that we can think about doing as individuals and also the bigger things that we need to do as organizations, as congregations and, and groups uh, across, even as ecumenical groups. I think that's wonderful. Um, there have been a few questions coming in the chat. Um, so one was specifically for Jeff. Um, Jeff, in your answer to the first question, you mentioned that the church is there at COP to remind everyone about the big picture. Um, how does the church do that concretely? That was from Louis. <laughs> yeah, so um, for, for, for me, when I was at COP, we had not easy access, but we had access to some of the actual negotiators or governmental representatives. Um, and so we were able to actually have conversation with the people who were part of the negotiations to um, just sort of remind them that right, it's not just about numbers, it's about people as well. Um, just sort of reminding them that like, you know, as Lutherans, like specifically as Lutherans, we are part of the Lutheran World Federation in Tanzania, in Papua New Guinea, like places where people are legitimate climate refugees. And as Kata mentioned, we are seeing that happen up in the north of Canada now. And that was not really a discussion that was being had five, 10 years ago, at least not like in the context of, the, of COP. Um, and so for, like for me, that was our, like a really tangible, of keeping the humanity and keeping a reminder of the bigger picture, so. Yeah, go ahead, Erica, you have something to add? Yeah, I can give a completely different example because um, that's kind of more on like the, the technical side, like the, the reaching the people who are really high up and, and making the decisions. And another way that we can bring the heart into it in the discussions is through stunts. And so um, at the gatherings, um, basically you could apply for um, a, a spot to do a stunt. So you would pick a certain place at the, the conference and with certain people do a specific event. And you, know, you had to give them all of the details so that they could make sure that it was acceptable. Um, but then you would have this opportunity to do something really creative and there would just be all kinds of people walking by and noticing your stunt. So it's basically kind of like a protest, but an anti-protest. So you're doing something creative, flashy, um, loud, or 
just something that will shock people and grab their attention to try to convey a message. And so that's one way that you can get them to feel something, whether it's feel the urgency or feel sad about what's happening or feel hopeful. You're just trying to play up the emotions as much as possible. And a lot of those people who will witness what you're doing are in positions of authority that they might be that same negotiator. Um, and so that's one kind of fun way, especially that youth can have an impact, um, thinking really creatively and not necessarily having to um, play up on the, the technical piece of it, but, but the emotions. Great. Um, yeah, we've heard lots of um, comments about advocacy. Um, so I'm going to take a question that was in there and kind of reframe it a bit of, I, I think if I said, should the church do advocacy, I think I know what your answer is. Um, so I'm going to shift it to what might faith-based advocacy look like? Um, Kata, I see you nodding. Do you want to answer first? <laughs> Um, I guess I just want to start by saying that I think it's important for us, uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself. So for me, it's important um, to acknowledge that I, I was invited to attend COP in person. And, you know, that for me was, you know, a two, a two month experience of getting trained and going and then doing follow up work and following up with events like this since. But our faith communities have full time staff who are doing this work year round. They say that um, two weeks of the year is COP and the other 50 weeks of the year is when the real work gets done. So we have, we have staff who are reading, reading, grueling, long, uncomfortable international treaties to understand what people are actually agreeing to. We, we have people who understand the language that they're using as difficult as it is, who are following the negotiations, um, building long-term relationships with country delegations, so um, I, I want to acknowledge that like my participation in COP was informed by people who are doing that work and, and then creating summary reports, presenting us with talking points. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of hard um, nitty gritty work. And uh, this is like what Jeff was talking about, about how people will fight about the individual words. But it's interesting how when you get into these fora, those individual words matter because that was what changes something from being legally binding to being a choice or a desire. So one of the things people talked about at COP26 is that there, there had been a clause that was saying we want to phase out um, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and coal power. And last minute that was changed to phase down inefficient fossil fuel subsidies and coal power. So I, I think we can hear, right, how that one word changes the intention of the whole phrase. Um, so, so one thing that we can do within our advocacy is that we can support people who are doing that work. We can, we can read their summary reports. We can pay attention because the more people who are paying attention to these things, um, the more we realize how, how much finagling politicians are trying to do here. So that, that's one thing with respect to, to our advocacy that we can do is we can put that pressure on our governments that comes from paying faithful attention to what they're trying to do. Um, so that, that was one thing that I was thinking of when I was thinking of advocacy is just acknowledging the role that, um, that those people play in the process. And we see that replicated within, within Kairos at ecumenical justice initiatives where there's, where there's staff who's doing that work. And I myself, I'm a representative on the partnership and rights circle, but again, they provide um, summaries of information to, to me and the other circle members so that we can make decisions on behalf of our faith communities. Um, but I really wanna up, uphold that there's people who do this work every day um, and, and keeping those positions, supporting those, those workers, that's, that's very valuable. Uh, Erica or Jeff, did you wanna add anything for answering that question? What might faith-based advocacy look like? If not, we have other questions too, but. I'll just quickly chime in. Yeah. Um, I know like in the past, like Bishop Susan has done a tremendous job of like letter writing to politicians. And I know that's a very like straightforward um, 
does it does much, but I, I think it does it go it it carries a lot of weight, especially since a lot of times church organizations, especially like respectable church organizations like the ELCIC, there comes a lot of gravity with what saying. Um, and so I think there's also that side of it as well that when when someone like Bishop Susan is co-signing a letter with like from the World Council of Churches or from even just within like a Canadian church context, like the Canadian Council of Churches, there's a lot of um, like moral ground that comes with that, which kind of helps push politicians. Yeah, I can just comment really quickly as well. Um, and bringing it back to last time we were talking about heart and emotion and that type of thing. And I think that's one strength that we have. And we're also, you know, an international community. So we have people who have really powerful stories um, in some countries that are experiencing climate change effects more than we are here. Um, we can use those powerful stories to try to bring attention to the issue here. Um, so some of the moments that I really remember and that resound with me from COP25 are hearing people talk about um, the hardships that they've endured in their country um, and, and specific examples of things that have happened. Um, I still remember today. So I think including those in our advocacy efforts can help make them more effective. Great, thank you. Okay, this is a question from Sue Tardif. Um, she's wondering if any of you engaged with anyone at COP or in the Lutheran Church around the roles that white supremacy and the military industrial complex plays in the global extraction climate crisis done on behalf of colonizer racial capitalism. Have there been conversations about what our per personal and collective accountability as white people is in that regard? It's a big question. Maybe I can start or Jeff, if you wanna go. I was just gonna say, I, I think you'll have something better to say than me, Kata, but um, it, from when we were like, this wasn't, this wasn't necessarily the language that was used a decade ago. Um, we didn't get into the military industrial complex at all, but in terms of um, uh, white supremacy that, again, that wasn't the, the language that was being used, but it was more so about the idea of colonialism um, and the responsibility of, of Western, more Western nations who have sort of benefited from extractive industries in the past. Um, and this was sort of touched on by Erica and Kata before. So, um, it was it wasn't really much of a discussion. I think it would be a much more robust discussion nowadays. Maybe I'll start with a comment on the military industrial complex. I think it's worth mentioning that I I, th I think my numbers are correct, but if, if someone knows, you can definitely correct me. But um, it's my understanding that the US military is the largest polluter in the world. They operate over 800 foreign military bases. They have the largest air force in the world and the US Navy has the second largest air force in the world. So um, the amount of emissions that come from uh, like the, the global imperialism of colonial and settler states continuing to exercise um, a hand of interventionism across the globe, you know, this, this is a major factor in our climate crisis. You know, they say that war is the biggest polluter and something that we see with like nuclear armament is, is that we face these existential threats replicated at scales every, every, every couple of years. So the amount of devastation that's caused by colonialism, imperialism, militarism is a significant factor um, when we consider as well that, you know, in times of peace, people want to make commitments to issues that they don't see as, you know, the, the most pressing, the most pressing issue at the moment. So in times of peace, maybe people will say, oh, we'll be net zero by 2050. But then as soon as there's, you know, armed conflict, you know, all of a sudden, this isn't, this isn't the main priority anymore. And damage to our infrastructures really discourages um, the kinds of systems level changes that we're trying trying to create. So 
Um, I think that that's important for us to remember is that um, the amount of destruction to land and communities caused by war um, is, is an existential threat in the same way that climate change is. And we see the impacts of militarism on the climate crisis. Um, and and it, especially something that's common now is this, this space race, which is linked to militarism and um, thinking about the, the emissions that we're causing through recreational space travel and things like this. So, so that's, a, that's a first comment. And then a second comment on uh, white supremacy is that I think that as, as, I, as I mentioned very briefly, but I'll elaborate a little bit more, you know, the, the mindset of white supremacy is one of oppression and domination and that's of people and land um, and that impacts um, within, within this society that is structured on a basis of white supremacy and colonial capitalism. Um, we, we, we live within that system every day. So uh, as, as a white person myself, I, I work to um, dismantle structures of white supremacy as they impact my, the way that I move through the world, the way that they impact my work as a white person who lives and works in an indigenous community, um, and also as a citizen of a nation that is based on the extraction of indigenous peoples off their land. So one of the things that I'm doing this month for Black History Month is that I'm working through this book, which I actually have right next to me, which is called what, Me and White Supremacy by Leila F. Saad. Um, and uh, I'm doing the 28 day challenge on white supremacy. So that's a continual commitment that I make to not replicating systems of colonialism in my work on land, um, which is in my perspective, fundamental to just climate action. Okay, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, one of the challenges in our church and our country are the number of people who work in an extractive industry. What is your advice for moving ahead in our call to climate justice? Anybody feel moved to tackle that one first? <laughs> um, one thing I would sort of comment on is the sort of like, at least from my perspective, it's not about strictly just saying like, okay, no more oil. It's about replacing that with other options. And I think as a church, we can, um, like if we can help start to emphasize that it's not about just ending something, but it's encouraging other areas. And like, I know that doesn't really answer the question and I don't know actually carries with people who work in an industry that we're kind of saying like, we got to stop this. Um, but at least my perspective is that it's not just about mitigation. It's about adaptation and change. And if you look at like the, just the history of technology in general, people have always been terrified when new technologies come in because they're worried that it's going to eliminate all these jobs. Um, but ultimately, efficiencies in one area have opened up other industries that we didn't even know were a thing. So it's not like an exact crossover, but I think it's a pretty similar comparison. And like how you articulate that, I'm not the person to to really do that. We have Bishop Susan here who is a great orator and Erica and Kata seem to be much better at conveying ideas of what we've experienced than I am, so. Okay, that is definitely not true. Um, but I can add on and say that I feel like often, at least in Alberta, it becomes about like us versus them. And so it's either the oil industry or you're advocating for the environment. Like there is zero overlap on that Venn diagram. So I think if there's some way that we could, and this might be like a super idealistic view, but if there's some way that we could get people kind of on the same, maybe not the same page, but like working together collaboratively and having engaging in discussion and not being like worried about discussing because they know that they're coming from opposite sides or, you know, 
like each party only thinking about their own kind of interests and just like feeling like the other is wrong. If we could stop kind of thinking about the differences and just think about like, okay, we have an issue, you know, maybe we don't have the exact same views, but like, how can we move forward? Cause at this point we've basically run out of time and like, <laughs> we just have to take action. Like both sides are, are not going to kind of get what they want. Um, and there's going to be compromises. And I feel like at this point, it's just like, what is the, the path of like least damage? So, um, a lot of people like are worried about loss of income or loss of their jobs, or, you know, maybe their identity is really tied to being in the oil industry, or they're worried about what would people think if they, you know, suddenly jumped on the climate change bandwagon when everyone that they know is an oil fanatic. So I think if systemically, like however that looks, it was more about kind of pivoting. And so, you know, how can we get the oil industry working a little bit more sustainably? Or how can we get some of those people transitioning um, that, you know, we can still assure like job security or um, maybe those new technologies can be profitable and, and we can start working on other industries. So again, it's kind of like a really broad answer, but I feel like if there's a way of coming together to achieve something positive, that people aren't focusing so much on what they're going to lose, but kind of focusing on the path forward. Thank you. Um, I know in our lead up conversations, I heard, uh, I can't remember which one of you, or maybe a couple of you mention um, the change in conversation that happened um, about trying to limit the global, like the targets to two degrees Celsius, and then it all of a sudden drastically switched to like 1.5, right? And so there's a question in the chat about um, what do you think about the assertion that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is no longer possible? Anybody want to tackle that one, Kata? Maybe I can come in here and start, and I'm sure that Jeff will have some interesting comments as well. But um, one of the one of the the different COPs have different goals, right? So in 2015, they signed the Paris Agreement, and the Paris Agreement text read that we're going to try we're going to limit warming to two degrees with an aim to limit it to 1.5 degrees. So that was making the agreement but they didn't finish the rules of how to enact that in agreement until COP26. So the goal for the Glasgow Climate Conference was to finalize the rule book for the Paris Agreement. So that was five years where we had had this existing treaty, but we hadn't had the rules of how to achieve what we said that we would achieve um, in 2015. And so at in Glasgow, the, the conversation was really like, okay, so now we're kind of, we're kind of understanding we really need to commit to 1.5 and the conversation was really about 1.5 and this is important because some countries want to say in 2015 we signed on for two degrees so now you're trying to change the conversation on us and that's not right because we agreed on two degrees in 2015 so for instance i heard saudi arabia make the, make this argument and that makes sense as their economy is largely based on um, fossil fuel resources, that, they, that they're resistant to this, this change. But the Marshall Islands, for instance, which is less than two meters above sea level, is saying, well, you're signing our death certificate if you won't let us have the conversation about 1.5. So the conversation in, at COP26 was really about how do we keep 1.5 alive? How do we create emissions reductions targets in name of 1.5? What happens if we overshoot 1.5? And it, it reflects a difference in opinion that I heard explained to me as a difference between like the North and the Western world and the, the South um, and uh, least developed countries, which is that Western nations would prefer to create an agreement to have it be perfect, their idea of perfect, and then to never adapt it. Whereas nations that are experiencing 
more damaging effects of climate change. They, they're in a less advantageous position to negotiate. They have less infrastructure, less staff, less money to keep participating in these negotiations that go on and on. They would rather sign an imperfect agreement, start the work now and continue to modify it over time. So you have um, an ideological difference between how people enter into these negotiations and how they see these, these documents as either living documents or as fixed in stone. And so at the end of, um, at the end of COP26, we signed the Glasgow Climate Pact um, and the COP president, Alok Sharma said, you know, we've, we've kept 1.5 alive, but the pulse is very weak. So there, there is the potential that we could overshoot 1.5 degrees if we, do not, um, if we do not achieve the targets that we've committed to. There is the potential that we could overshoot 1.5 and through carbon capture technologies, we could then reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to get back down below 1.5. But that is, not, um, that is not as sustainable a solution because there is a cascade of environmental impacts that we will hit if we pass 1.5 degrees of warming. For instance, this resonates for me as a permafrost scientist because 24% of the Northern hemisphere is covered in permafrost and the, um, the turning point for the release of greenhouse gases that are stored in the, in the permafrost is 1.5 degrees of warming. If we pass 1.5 degrees of warming, um, that will cause such significant permafrost thaw that it will release greenhouse gases stored in the frozen ice, such as methane, lots of other things. So um, keeping one to 1.5 degrees is important to me personally, as someone who lives in permafrost environments, but also because um, that is what creates the best conditions for uh, the reduce of global suffering. Um, we face a challenging task to achieve the targets that people have said that they'll commit to. We consistently see people make targets and then blow past them. So th this, this is our work. Is it out of reach? No. Is it the most ideal situation with the current IPCC report saying, well, we could hit 1.5 degrees of warming by 2040? That's not ideal. We got a lot of work to do. But you know, we're, we're out here having the conversations. The conversations are slowly turning in the direction that we're trying to go. Um, so so there, there's hope within the challenge. My hope is greater than my despair. I like that phrase, hope within the challenge. I think that really speaks to us as Christians too, right? To, to hold on to our hope even when we do face challenges. Um, I'm just cognizant of the time. Um, so we got to most of the questions in the chat, but uh, I want to honor the time commitment that we asked of our panelists and all of you uh, participants. Um, so I'm going to call on Bishop Kathy from the BC Synod to do our closing remarks. And I'm going to pin her so you can see her. There she is. Um, and I hand it over to you, Bishop Kathy. Thanks very much, Gretchen. Oh my goodness, what a morning. Uh, wow. I, I mean, just some little pieces that for me, climate crisis rather than climate change, partners, community, faith, global responsibility, love beyond greed. Science has hands, but no heart. People of faith can provide the heart. I am just so glad that this is recorded because I know, I don't know about you, I need to listen again, uh, maybe maybe more than once, to really uh, take in all of what kind of our three panelists have been sharing with us this morning. Um, it's just so, you know, we talk about how to be influential. You have been so influential uh, to me and to all of us this morning. And I'm, I'm thankful for your willing, uh, your willingness to the, uh, to Erica and Kata and Jeff, for taking all of this time. I know it's your passion, but it's still uh, such a great gift to all of us to be able to learn with uh, and from you this morning. But also that you would take the time to go to to uh, COP and um, and be there and do all the learning that's required. I look forward to hearing even more over time. Um, yeah, you are just so inspiring. So on behalf of the BC Synod Climate Action Justice Group, thank you. And thanks for sharing your experiences. 
thanks also Bishop Susan for uh, guiding us and leading us through and assistant to the bishops Gretchen as well as way in the background Paul uh, for just keeping things moving along. Kind of, I can't say it as well as you. I'm kind of like Jeff thinking, wow, I don't know if I should ever even open my mouth <laughs> near you. You are so articulate. Um, but you, you, you spoke just a little bit about kind of this way that climate justice and reconciliation are intertwined um, and the role that white supremacy plays in, I think the term you used, the domination of of people and land, uh, this colonial mindset that is still so deeply ingrained in each of us, but also in our church and uh, things that we must continue to learn. So I just wanna, on the way out here, just invite all of you to uh, join us for Lent. We're gonna look again at the doctrine of discovery, but do that as a whole community and uh, the Journey to Reconciliation group uh, will be leading that 20 minute kind of Vesper service and then uh, on to an hour long discussion. And it, it will explore kind of these relationships that uh, Indigenous people have with the land and how white supremacy has been so incredibly harmful. So with that, let's uh, close with a prayer um, that's it comes from the season of creation that I'm certain all of you are very familiar with as well. Let us pray. Creator God, all things live and move and have their being in you. We praise you, God, for the earth that sustains life. Our demand for growth and an endless cycle of production and consumption are exhausting our world. The forests are leached, the topsoil erodes, the fields fail and deserts advance. The cities, sorry, the seas acidify, the storms intensify. Humans and animals are forced to flee in search of security. You made us in your image with power and responsibility to seek the good for all in Earth's great web of life. Guide us and empower us to carry out our responsibilities and exercise our power towards change and the support of all your good creation. For you ask this in the name of the one who is creator, redeemer, and life giver. Amen. Thank you all for joining. Um, have a great day. And I wish us all the chance to find uh, a way that to tackle this challenge in our own lives and in our, our systems and bigger organizations we're a part of. So blessings on your day. Thank you so much, Kata, Jeff, and Erica. It's been so great to spend all this time with you.